Will you join me in prayer? Father God, this, this is a day you've made. And help us to rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you for yet another chance. The chance to worship and praise you, to, to learn from your word, to remember at your table what Jesus did on the cross for all of us. And help us to truly, truly appreciate the sacrifice he made and, and to live lives of service and gratitude in his name. And Father, it's in Jesus' name. I ask for guidance this morning. Let the words of my mouth be, be useful and acceptable in thy sight. Amen. Happy New Year. <laughs> Let's all say happy birthday to Kevin, okay? One, two, three. Happy birthday, Kevin! Now, he's not going to like me saying this from up here, but, you know, some folks don't really know him all that well. And for those of us who really do know him well, I think his birthday is a good time to remember just what a, an amazing example of selfless service he is. You know, I, I can't list all the, name, all the things he does for us here at the fountain because he doesn't want any credit. He doesn't look for credit. But, you know, we have a men's group that meets every Friday at 6.30. Well, Kevin's in here more than an hour ahead of time, putting on the coffee, getting the heater going, setting up the, the room. Lately, he's had to do that with one arm. And he's just amazing. Um, he's here bright and early on Sundays to help set things up. He's here, he's here on Wednesdays for the kids. He's here pretty much whenever we want him. You know, if, except for the Holy Spirit, we might say that Kevin's our chief comforter. You know, I, I imagine he's been in more hospital rooms beside more sick beds at more celebrations of life and memorials than just this year than most of us will see in a lifetime. And you know what? In all his... I've known him for about 15 years, a little more than 15 years, and with regard to helping people, comforting people, giving service, I can only remember him complaining about one thing, though I, I admit it's, he's probably complained about that more than once. Those things on the wall, those thermostats, he wishes people wouldn't touch those. So my first suggestion for a New Year's resolution for all you guys is Leave the thermostats alone. <laughs> okay, so, then, so since it is New Year's, I'm going to talk to you a little more about resolutions. Now, I considered making a resolution for myself. I was going to stop all my bad habits. But then I realized nobody likes a quitter. So I'm going to offer a New Year's blessing instead. May all of your problems, all of your trials, last as long as your resolutions. We joke about it, right? But do we ever think about what God thinks of our resolutions, especially the broken ones? You know, the ancient Babylonians were certainly concerned. Archaeologists have determined that about 4,000 years ago, they used to have an annual 12-day ceremony, 12 days, to reaffirm the old king or crown a new one. There may have been some wisdom in that one-year thing, instead of waiting for a four-year term, but shouldn't talk about that. Uh, um, it was also a time to pay debts and to return any objects they'd borrowed, especially farming equipment, plows, that kind of thing. The most important part, most important part of the ceremony was surely to make resolutions, promises, promises to the many deities they worshipped. And breaking those resolutions would mean falling out of favor and risking the wrath of some very vindictive gods. So to help with our resolutions, I picked some snippets of biblical wisdom. So I'm going to jump all over God's word today, and instead of going chapter by chapter, verse by verse, like we usually do here at the fountain. And it's going to sound just a little bit different from the NASB that we're used to, because just for fun, and to remind us all that God used the people of Israel to bring the word, that's the Lord Yeshua, into the world and to spread his message. I'm going to read from the Tree of Life version today. It's a fairly new Bible, uh, first published in 2015, that emphasizes the Hebrew roots of Messiah Yeshua, God's anointed one, who we know as Jesus Christ, and who we should look to not only as our Savior, 
but as our Lord and King. Now, I don't want us to forget how important context is. You know, context, context, context. Most of you have heard that for a long time. And that wise admonition to never read a single Bible verse, but always to read what comes before and what comes after. But I'm going to bend that rule a little bit today, trying to leave time for football and shopping. And we'll start with, we'll start with Sam's message from three weeks ago, from Luke 9. Now, when Yeshua called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority over all the demons and to heal disease. He sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. So Jesus had empowered the disciples and sent them off two by two to drive out demons and cure the sick. It wasn't their main purpose, of course, just as Jesus didn't come just to perform miracles. As we all know from Matthew, oh, excuse me, he sent them to declare the kingdom of God. And as we all know from Matthew 28, after he'd risen from that tomb, just before leaving this earth, he commissioned them and us to continue, continue declaring God's kingdom, saying, go therefore and make disciples, all nations, immersing them in the name of the Father and the Son in the Ruach HaKodesh, teaching them to observe all I've commanded you. And remember, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So during Sam's sermon that day, he challenged all of us with, to make sharing Jesus a mission of our lives. A challenge he repeats every Sunday when he tells us to go and be the body of Christ. Now, we don't have the advantage of miracle cures or banishing demons. But evangelizing should probably be pretty close to the top of our resolution list. We can tell others what Jesus has meant in our lives. Following week, two weeks ago, we heard about an eight-day Jewish festival that is not a Jewish substitution for Christmas. Though it falls around the same time of year, and it, it does celebrate a miracle. God's fingerprints are all over Hanukkah. It was an untrained group of Jewish warriors, the Maccabees, who knew God was their only chance, that took back the temple from the greatest global power of the time. And the menorah, the lampstand, the candles, continued to burn for eight days despite a lack of consecrated oil. And there's more to the story that you didn't hear about. Rabbinic commentary, the Peskita Rabadi Midrash, on, it's all about Jewish festivals. Midrash is kind of like their Bible commentary. Anyway, that Midrash indicates that the menorah had been stolen. There was no menorah. The Maccabees, while cleaning and restoring the temple and rebuilding the altar, found no menorah to light. Now, whether this is legend or tradition, I don't really know, but it has it that they found iron bars, maybe spears, that they used to fashion a makeshift menorah. Some sages suggest they use their own swords. There's an even more interesting theory, that they used spears left behind by fleeing enemy soldiers. This is something we can't know for sure, but it could very well be that God arranged, God arranged for the enemy who had tried to extinguish faith in him to leave behind the means to provide for that, for shining his light. It's a possibility. Hanukkah is a very important Hebrew word, meaning dedication. And the Apostle John mentions Jesus being in the temple during the festival of dedication which was, wasn't just a commemoration of retaking the temple, but of rededicating the people to serving and worshiping the one true God. I found a, a beautiful Hanukkah message from three years ago by a Messianic rabbi in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Rabbi Isaac Russell told his congregation, I'd like to propose to you that there are, in fact, nine Hanukkahs, not seven. We we are the eighth Hanukkah of light, 
All of us are called to dedicate ourselves to Hashem. The ninth Hanukkah of light is the Hanukkah of Messiah Yeshua. He's the Shemash, the servant candle. He's our example of total dedication to Hashem. But he's also, also the one who lights our fire of dedication and empowers us to shed that light to the world. Hashem in Hebrew means the name and is used by the Jews to refer to God because they don't want to risk taking his name in vain. But dedication to God is another resolution that should rank pretty high, pretty high on our list. And Paul gives some, some wonderful guidance to the Colossians, which we might want to borrow when considering how to dedicate our own lives. I'll be reading parts of chapter 3. Focus your mind on things above, not on things on earth. Put to death what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, and greed. That's idolatry. Set them all aside. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and foul language. Do not lie to one another. Clothe yourselves in tender compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bearing with one another, forgiving each other if anyone has a grievance against another. Just as the Lord pardoned you, so also you must pardon others. But above all things, put on love, which is the bond of perfect harmony. Let the wisdom, let the shalom of Messiah rule in your hearts. Be thankful. Let the word of Messiah dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another with all wisdom. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Yeshua, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And John echoes that message of love, that bond of perfect harmony. We read in chapter 4 of his first letter, starting from verse 7. Loved ones, let us love one another. For love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. And this is love. Not that we've loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atonement for our sins. Loved ones, if if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is made perfect in us. So what do we have so far for potential resolutions? We've got sharing God's word, evangelism, right? Right? which of course means spending more time in the Bible. We've got dedication to God and all those things Paul told the Colossians to focus on and clothe themselves with, especially love. It's a pretty good start, right? So I'm going to interrupt this resolution discussion now because when Sam asked me to preach on January 1st today, it wasn't just the new year and resolutions that popped into my head. For some reason, the calendar also came to mind. And with that, something that's always amazed me, maybe it's amazed some of you, the eternity of God. God's timelessness is described beautifully at the beginning of Psalm 90, a prayer of Moses, the man of God. My Lord, you've been our dwelling from generation to generation. Before the mountains were born or you gave birth to the earth or the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. A thousand years in your sight are, are like a day just passing by or like a watch in the night. Our lives are short, right? And we grow frail with age. But God does not weaken or fail with the passage of time. Now, my pea brain has a hard time with the concept of God's eternal existence. Our lives are governed by time, right? Alarms, schedules, appointments, anniversaries, deadlines. But somehow, somehow it seems that his celestial schedule and our terrestrial schedules are hardly ever in sync. We know he wants us to be cognizant of time, and the seasons, because we find it just 14 verses in to 
the first chapter of his inspired scripture. God made it, so time must be important. But he seems to have a totally different perspective, much more relaxed sense of urgency. I suppose that comes from being above and outside the sphere of time, seeing all of eternity's past and all of eternity's future. However, I expect there may be some of you who are with me and not being able to totally wrap our minds around that timelessness, that everlasting to everlasting thing. And there seems to be a pretty common human desire. We all seem to want him to conform to our time schedules. And I expect every one of us, every one of us can think of a time we just had to trust him. Because of what we considered were unmet wants or unmet needs or what we might have even called unanswered prayers. And we know there'll be more storms to face. Even though we're in God's will, there's going to be more storms to face. You probably all, you probably all remember the sea crossing in Matthew chapter 8. In verse 18, Matthew records, Now when Yeshua saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go to the other side. So it's on Jesus' orders the disciples were rowing to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, right? Following the will of God, they're rowing. And what happens? They ended up in a storm so violent, they thought they were going to die. And do you remember what Jesus was doing? You do remember, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's fair to say the world is in the middle of a storm today. It's a whopper. And it might seem to some as if God is sleeping. He'd probably like to ask those thinking that way, those suspecting him of ignoring our problems or that he doesn't care or is sleeping. He'd probably ask why they have so little faith. The world is in the middle of a terrible storm. But if we're living in God's will, we have the promise from Scripture that it will work out for good. We may think the boat is filling up, but we need to trust God. Get close to Him and pray for and encourage one another. God will take us to the other side, wherever that may be, and it will be good. Of course, it's all about timing, His timing. So let's talk a bit, this is the fun part, let's talk a bit about how man has tried to keep track of time through the ages, the months and the seasons. The calendar and its history are fascinating, and there's way too much to share this morning because I, I still want us to face those resolutions and before football or shopping. But I discovered people have really, really struggled with time for a long time, and there's some interesting stuff I thought you might like to know. So in order to keep track of the months and seasons, man needs a reference point. Did you ever think of that? We need a reference point. And God let us know in verse 14 of the first chapter of Genesis that he put the sun and the moon in the sky not just for light, but also for signs and for seasons and for days and years. But you know what? He didn't give explicit instructions on how to use those signs. And he didn't set things up so that it was all that easy to calculate. In ancient times, most calendars were based on the phases of the moon. In the new year, it started in the spring. And originally for the Jews, there was no fixed calendar at all. The Sanhedrin, their ruling body, would determine whether the month would be 29 or 30 days long. You want to know how they figured it out? They depended on a witness who might have spotted the, the new moon. <laughs> and God's instructions to the Jews after they left Egypt was to make Abib or Aviv the first month of the year. And Aviv doesn't even really, it's not really the name of the month. It just means green or young ears of grain, which means the year was to start in the spring, not, not the dead of winter. Before their exile, it was customary just to refer to the months by a number, 1st, 2nd, 10th, 11th. But after exile, the Jews returned from Babylon, and they used names very similar to the Babylonian calendar. In the book of Esther, we see Nisan confirmed as the first month of the year. 
That's the month of Passover. However, typical of their historical behavior, the religious leaders took things into their own hands. Most likely around the first or second century after Jesus, first first or second century A.D. And they made Tishrei. Tishrei, that's God's seventh month, first on their civil calendar. Most of you have probably heard of Rosh Hashanah. Now observed by Jews around the world as the beginning of the new year. Now the first day of the seventh month is ordained by God for a sacred assembly and the memorial sounding of the shofar, a trumpet. But God didn't give that sacred day a name. Neither Rosh Hashanah nor the Feast of Trumpets are mentioned in Scripture. But the Jews made it into a beautiful 10-day period of penitence. It's beautiful. The first two days to acknowledge God as king and a whole week to consider thoughts and actions in the past year that weren't so good and to ask for forgiveness. And then on the 10th day, a day God did command and designate, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Now, one story is that respected rabbis determined that trumpet blast, that shofar, signaled the coronation of a king. They assumed the king in question was God and determined that must have been the day that Adam and Eve were created. Meaning the world itself must have been created five days earlier because he couldn't be declared king with a trumpet until he had someone to rule over. Some rabbis also thought the end of the Babylonian Babylonian captivity was more important than the end of Egyptian slavery. They also pointed to Tishrei, God's seventh month, being the month the ark came to rest, and the month of Sukkot, or tabernacles. And the first day of Tishrei had been the day Ezra read the Torah to the people in Jerusalem after they came back from exile and completed and dedicated that wall. All good reasons in their minds to change God's calendar. So as I said, folks have been confused about time for a long time. You probably remember from your Bible reading that Abraham was from Ur. Now, archaeological records indicate Ur was founded about 3,800 years before Jesus. And it appears that for about 17 centuries, cities, cities in Ur worked off their own individual calendars. Must have been tough on the travelers, right? When Joseph was betrayed by his brothers, the Egyptian year was probably still being divided into three seasons, all based on the flooding of the Nile. And by the time of the Roman Republic, about 509 B.C., there had been lots and lots of experimentation with lunar calendars and combination solar lunar calendars. And as you might very well suppose, calendars in different places and times around the world would regularly fall out of sync with the seasons, with the stars, with the moon phases, and with each other. I wonder if you know this. The moon phases average about 29 and a half days. So 12 lunar months end up being about 11 days out of sync with the sun, which of course created problems for the farmers especially and led to some very creative calendars. I wonder how many of you know how long it takes for the earth to go around the sun. 365.242189 days. And that point two four two one eight nine computes to five hours, forty eight minutes, and forty five plus seconds. Not quite a quarter of a day. And that difference of eleven minutes and fourteen plus seconds is enough to push the calendar out of alignment with the equinoxes by about three days every four hundred years. You probably all know how we compensate for that, right? We add an intercalary day to February, which used to be the last month of the year. And we call it leap year. But a problem still remains. If the Lord tarries, 
There'll be no February 29th in the year 2300, or 2500, or 2600, or 2700. Years divisible by 100 do not have an extra day, so are not leap years, unless, unless they're divisible by 400, as was the year 2000. Okay, so I've probably reached the point of TMI, right? Too much information? I'll try to get through the rest quickly so we get back to those resolutions. I won't go into detail about leap seconds or how messed up the Roman calendar was with only 10 months. That was about three months ahead of the solar calendar in 48 BC when Julius Caesar first proposed a change and how the priests didn't like his change because they were in charge of the intercalary days and could influence how long people were in power. Or how two years later, Julius Caesar, under the guidance of an Alexandrian astronomer, Sisygenes, added two whole months, actually more than two whole months, 67 days, to the calendar between November and December. And that's after they'd already had a previous adjustment, resulting in 46 BC being 445 years long. Bet you didn't know that. And how he made January the first month of the year to honor Janus. Janus was a god with two faces who symbolized to them new beginnings and who they thought could see both the future and the past. Now, the Julian calendar is very similar to what we use now, the Gregorian calendar. 365 and a quarter days. All the months were divided into 30 or 31 days except February. And they had leap years. But strangely, without a February 29th. They just did an instant replay of February 23rd. I don't know why. But Sisygenes had missed the mark by 11 minutes and 14 plus seconds, which by the Middle Ages had shifted the dates of the seasons by about 10 days. That should give some context for all that leap year info I bored you with a little bit ago. Anyway, Pope Gregory XIII was especially concerned about Easter, which had fallen farther and farther from the spring equinox, the traditional day of Easter observance. And the commission he appointed took five years, five years to calculate and come up with the calendar we use today. It was instituted on February 24th, 1582, and decreed officially by the Catholic Church October 4th. People in Catholic countries woke up the next day on October 15th. But because Gregory was the Pope, Catholic countries like France, Spain, Italy, Portugal, adopted the new calendar right away. Protestants, however, were a little suspicious. Some even believed it was a work of the Antichrist. There were 19 different dates of adoption just by the different regions in Germany. Sounds like they hadn't advanced much from the Euro system 4,400 years earlier. The Protestant regions of Germany stalled until 1700. It's 118 years after the Pope's decree. And England and its colonies, the English Empire, that's us, they resisted even longer until 1752. And in England, it provoked demonstrations and near riots with the people accusing the Catholics of stealing 11 days out of their lives. New Year's Day in America had always, up to that time, been celebrated on March 25th, but changed to January 1st with the passage of the Calendar Act. 1752. People going to sleep on September 2nd of that year woke up on September 14th, which created a substantial bit of confusion. Okay, enough with the calendars. Time to buckle down to those resolutions. But I'll start by telling you I'm a hypocrite. I can't even remember making a resolution, much less keeping one. But I'm now going to borrow words and ideas from several people and from Scripture to show really is a pretty good idea. You know, a great many resolutions probably fail because we aren't willing to make the sacrifices necessary to reach them. We want to do better, be better. Let's face it, most of us are weak. Even the Apostle Paul had that problem. We all know the passage in Romans 7. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is in my flesh. For the will is present in me, but but to do the good work is not. For the good that I want, I do not do. 
But the evil I do not want, this I, this I do. So for help with those resolutions, we need to turn to God. Even Paul. Confessing our sins to him. Asking Jesus to help us live the lives, to live our lives the way we should. To become the person he wants us to be. Philippians chapter 4 might be the place we find our first or at least some of our resolutions. Rejoice in the Lord always. Let your gentleness be known to all people. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Ephesians 4 has some good stuff too. Be angry, yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger and quarreling and slander along with malice. Instead, be kind to one another, compassionate, forgiving each other just as God and Messiah also forgave you. And it's hard to top Romans 12. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. So resolutions are definitely biblical. I mean, we count on God to keep his promises and should be faithful in keeping our own, even the ones we make to ourselves. What is not biblical would be limiting them to the new year. There's nothing sacred about the month of January for making resolutions or for planning. And if we stumble, if we stumble in keeping a resolution, there's no reason to wait for another New Year's Day to renew it. I like Dr. John Maxwell's suggestion that we practice basin theology. Basin theology. Do you remember what Jesus said the night before Gethsemane? And he took a basin and he washed the feet. He washed the feet of his disciples. I've given you an example. You should do for each other what I've done for you. Jesus was emphasizing the golden rule, following up on his answer to the scribe about the greatest commandments. And Dr. Maxwell advises, if we want to get close to God, find someone to serve. That those who serve others are the happiest people even when people's needs rarely fit our own time schedules. You know, it was actually kind of fun looking for resolution ideas. And I found a, I found a few more you might want to consider. Start each day by considering how to make God happy, how to bring Him greater glory. Work on developing a worldview, a philosophy of life that's biblical, a biblical worldview, which, of course, means spending more time in the Bible. How about memorizing a list of reasons for believing in God? You know, when we hear a skeptic or a non-believer say something like, there's no evidence for God, our first impulse might be just to not get into an argument or not, not provoke a confrontation, right? Dr. William Lane Craig says a list can really come in handy. And he suggests that rather than arguing, we might even pretend to be a little surprised and respond, oh, you don't think so? Well, I can think of at least five reasons for believing in God. And you might add, you know, I've heard more and more scientific evidence is turning up all the time for God's fine-tuning of the universe. And hopefully, they'll challenge you, allowing you to use your list of memorized reasons, number one. Every know, everything we know of that begins to exist has a maker. So the best explanation for anything that comes into existence is God. The best explanation for life is a creator. You know the odds against a living organism, just an amoeba, against any living organism existing anywhere, even here on earth, are astronomical. Life popping out of nothing just doesn't make sense. Number three, without God to set the standard, we wouldn't have real justice or morality. It'd be arbitrary. 
I think God is the best explanation for why, in our hearts, we know the difference between right and wrong. Number four, God is the best explanation for Jesus' life. So many prophecies were fulfilled. His crucifixion's history. And the best explanation for that empty tomb is God. And that so many were willing to die rather than deny they'd witnessed his resurrection is best explained by the fact they did see him alive after his confirmed death. And five, God can be known personally. The thousands of personal experiences, including miracles, answered prayers, and near-death experiences. And just one of those thousands of personal encounters is four-year-old Colton Burpo, who, while undergoing an emergency appendectomy that nearly took his life, met and converse, excuse me, met and conversed with Jesus, a grandfather he had never met, and a sister who had been stillborn. You can read this story in the book, Heaven is Real. Dr. Craig says that just having the list is often enough. I may just close down the argument. So you don't even have to add the rationale or justification. You can put that farther down your list of resolutions. You know, it might also be good to resolve to find time to read Eric Metaxas' book, Is Atheism Dead? The main point being there's been so much scientific evidence For God discovered just in the last 50 years that it's no longer tenable. No longer tenable to deny the intelligent design of the universe. No longer tenable is just a fancy, polite way of saying, makes no sense. We know so much from science now that it's really dumb not to believe in God. I'm going to wrap this up with some resolution suggestions from a radio commentator who's on fire for Jesus, Stacy Washington, who does a nightly radio show from 9 to midnight and has recently written a book titled Eternally Cancel Proof, a guide for courageous Christians navigating the political battlefront. So the following are not my words, but hers from a few weeks ago at Grace Church in St. Louis, Missouri. Hearing them, I'm hoping we'll feel her love for our Lord and maybe Maybe catch a little of her passion so that we can be better salt and light for the world. Got to get into character here. If you're alive, you're called for a purpose. Ask God what he wants you to do and ask him for the courage to do it and then do it. Doesn't matter how old you are. You have gifts you can use for God's kingdom. God will use you if if you ask him to. In your quiet time, your prayer time, when listening to hymns or praise songs, ask God to use you. And then consider each step, each step an adventure or a dress rehearsal for reigning and ruling with Jesus. Now, we're supposed to be excited about serving now and, and about eventually joining him in glory. We should be excited about talking about God and sharing Jesus with others. I mean, come on, rising from the dead is no daily occurrence. It should generate a little excitement. Our God can do anything, has done amazing things, and will do still who knows what. He promised to prepare a place for us. And if we're scared, we need to rebuke that fear in Jesus' name. The enemy wants you scared. God, he just wants you. We need to love him as much as he loves us. We need to ask him to help us do great stuff in his name. And great stuff might just be sharing Jesus with a grandchild or or a friend or even a stranger. Maybe while in line at Costco or the DMV. Now, we often forget about our blessings. We let the enemy. We let the enemy, the noise of evil, Drown out God's still small voice. You know, a good resolution for the new year might be to shut the devil down. Don't give him control. Count your blessings. Maybe keep a gratitude journal and write those blessings down. Just the fact that we're here today worshiping together in the open is something that millions in the world can't even dream of. 
So remember, we serve a God who's the very essence of love. He does not lie. He cannot fail. And all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And his purpose? His purpose is for us to trust in Jesus. If we really trust him, things will work out for good. It may not seem that way in this lifetime, but we have the promise of eternity with him. Let's all ask God continuously to help us make and keep resolutions that will help us to love him with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and with all our strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves.